Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Rogers. I'll be talking to you today about the high resolution mass spectrometry advances in oil spill analysis uh, facilitated by GOMRI funding. The first simple question can be why high resolution mass spectrometry? Uh, and that uh, I hope to address in the following slides. First and foremost, uh, GC-based methods, traditional uh, methods, rely on uh, bookkeeping technique where the parent crude oil is analyzed at uh, isomeric level most of the time and then is compared against field samples. Compositional changes can be ascribed to weathering, the loss of low molecular weight alkanes, the water washing of one to three ring aromatics, and most importantly, source identification is provided by persistent hopane and sterines. The major shortcoming of this technique is that it does not address new species that are generated from weathering processes as they are typically oxidized and are of higher boiling point. That is not a problem for higher resolution mass spectrometry. And in cases where the low molecular weight species have been lost and nothing but the high boiling point remains, in this case, a, a vac bottom, uh, we can readily get uh, compositional analysis in this, the identification of 105,000 different uh, peaks in the mass spectrum, uh, regardless of boiling point or heteratom composition. And that is uh, extremely powerful since most of the uh, transformation products uh, are formed through oxidation. Even if the GC-based uh, techniques were able uh, to get these materials off the column, the mass analyzer would be incapable of resolving them. Uh, an example here is shown at one nominal mass where there are 462 peaks uh, detected in a weathered oil sample. Uh, this by any other mass spectrometer would be one or a collection of unresolved peaks uh, however, in the high resolution, you can clearly see baseline uh, resolution uh, and determination of the accurate mass for all 462 peaks. That's important because in FTICR mass spectrometry, uh, we take the mass spectrum, we get the accurate mass of every one of the resolved peaks out to the fifth decimal place. Uh, this is 50 to 200 part per billion. We then group them according to their heteratom content or that which is not carbon and hydrogen. Uh, here is the S1 class. Once we have them all grouped, the relationship between carbon and hydrogen and heteratom content uh, provides a double bond equivalent number or the number of rings plus double bonds. And the carbon number is just the carbon number. So a plot of all of the S1 species as a function of DBE versus carbon number gives you the compositional space of the individual class and allows you to monitor it as a function of external processes. Uh, in this case, it's going to be weathering. So we hope to uh, utilize ultra high resolution mass spectrometry to address uh, the problem shown in this picture, which is uh, the chemical composition of surface uh, mousses and slicks. And so here you see both surface mousses and what appears to be chemically modified uh, species changed in color. Uh, and so through GOMRI funding, we were uh, asked to provide uh, insight uh, into this, these processes. Previous research, uh, most notably from the Ixtox bill, uh, noted changes in these surface slicks and attributed them to photochemical uh, processes. They highlighted three of importance uh, indirect and direct photooxidation, photodecomposition, or the breaking of molecules into smaller molecules from photoprocesses, and the opposite, photopolymerization, uh, the formation of larger or higher molecular weight materials through photoactivation and reaction uh, to form new species. The problem is, is that in 1980, uh, analytical technologies made it difficult to deal with the heteratom content, uh, most notably oxygen as well as sulfur, um, and there was a noted need for advanced techniques in the report uh, by Ed Overton and, and John Farrington. Three years later, uh, Thingstad and co-workers uh, put forth uh, a hypothesis on how the surface mousses are formed. Most notably, you have uh, photochemical oxidation of the nonpolar oil components to form surfactants. Uh, and these surfactants uh, are oil soluble. 
but they interact with water, uh, and that's what causes increased viscosity and uh, surface mousse formation. So in addition to the three on the slide before, we also need to uh, add surfactants to the list. In our first uh, characterization of field samples, in comparison to the Macondo well uh, head oil, it was quite obvious that uh, we were able to identify uh, transformation products, uh, simply that the complexity of the field samples was two and a half times that of the original Macondo uh, well oil. So clearly new species are being formed. Those new species are revealed when you zoom to a single nominal mass and compare the parent mass spectrum, which is positive, of the Macondo well oil versus that of the Pensacola beach extract. And you see that all of the red species are new peaks, uh, all of which, uh, or most of which, contain oxygen. So clearly there's an oxidative process uh, that is going on in the environment that's creating these uh, the field samples. That is readily apparent in the class graph where we combine all the species in the class 01, 02, and 03, all the way up to 06. In positive electrospray, we, we characterize ketones. Uh, and so you can see a distribution all the way up to six oxygens per molecule. We see a similar distribution, albeit slightly different in that it starts at 02 when we're looking at the acidic species, uh, most notably because carboxylic acids are the dominant species and they contain two oxygens but they also uh, go out to six oxygens. So clearly uh, in field samples, we have uh, uh, oxidative uh, processes that have occurred to generate the species that we're detecting. What's generating these oxidized species? Um, I don't really have time to get into this, so I'll just cut to the chase. And it's, it's not uh, bio-oxidation, it's photo-oxidation. Um, it is the dominant process that forms uh, these oxidized species that are detected in field samples. So in order to uh, reveal that, we did photo ox only microcosms. This is characterization of the uh, oil soluble uh, species that remain after photo radiation. Uh, you can clearly see uh, they have a similar distribution from the field samples from O1 all the way out to 11 uh, oxygens per molecule. The most notable thing is how quickly it occurs. So after six days, you're already at the equilibrium of the later 18-day and 30-day distributions. When we compare uh, what was detected in the microcosm experiments, shown in black, to that of a four-year time series of field samples in a collaboration with LSU, uh, we see a very nice uh, correlation between the micro, uh, the micro uh, cosm and the field samples. Uh, this again uh, supports the idea that photooxidation is responsible for these materials and field samples. If we take it a step further and we, char we characterize uh, the acidic species in negative ion electrospray and we compare field samples on the left with photo-only microcosms on the right, Again, for the 03 and 04 classes, and as well as all the other classes, we see a very uh, similar distribution uh, in carbon number and DBE, further supporting that, that photo ox is what is generating these materials and field samples. Finally, if we go one step further and isolate the ketone transformation products, uh, characterize them in positive ion electrospray, uh, we see a photo-only microcosm on top and three field samples from three different locations and three time points. Uh, we see that there is a very uh, clear similarity between what's generated in the photo-only microcosm to what is observed in field samples. We also note that uh, photooxidation uh, appears to generate interfacial material. This is unpublished results from Matt Tarr and Phoebe Zito that shows that uh, a dark control compared to 20, 12 hour, 24 hour, 48 and 120 hour with uh, uh, high stirring rates, uh, you can clearly see the formation of uh, peanut butter like material that is uh, water laden uh, petroleum. And so the question becomes, in the oil soluble uh, oxidized species that we see from the microcosm experiments, um, where are the interfacially active species? And so it turns out that we actually have a method to isolate these. And so when we do, 
that distribution splits into two distributions. So the low oxygen content is not interfacially active and the higher oxygen content is interfacially active. And so for the first time, we we're able to confirm that there is interfacially active species in photo irradiated petroleum and characterize them. When you do a full mass balance and compare them to the water solubles as well, you can see there's a clear trend in oxygen content, low oxygen content is oil soluble, non interfacially active, higher oxygen content, but oil soluble gives you interfacially active material. And then high, even higher oxygen content is uh, water soluble species. It does not, however, address the change in solubility from oil soluble to water soluble. That can be visualized in a separate plot of oxygen content versus carbon number. And we can clearly see that carbon number is what dictates water solubility, which makes sense because very, very high carbon number species are very hydrophobic and it takes a ton of oxygen to get them uh, into water. And so although the distributions overlap, uh, their differences are in carbon number uh, for a given class. So if we put everything together from dark to day 30 photo irradiation, we can see that from the start, you just have the naturally occurring surfactants in the oil. Uh, after photo irradiation, you generate more surfactants, some of which get high enough oxygen to become interfacially active. Subsequent photo oxidation of those starts to generate water solubles. And this process just continues until you reach sort of this pseudo equilibrium where you have uh, the highest oxygen content uh, that will remain oil soluble, oil soluble, but interfacially active, and then ultimately water soluble. So from the Ixtox spill, uh, there were three uh, processes that were outlined, indirect and direct photooxidation, photo decomposition and polymerization. If we go one by one to uh, evaluate what high resolution mass spectrometry has to say about each one, in the comparison of the salt marsh versus the photo ox only microcosm, there are clearly indirect because these do not have an aromatic ring or a chromophore versus direct those higher ring that do uh, have a chromophore. So both indirect and direct photo oxidation are obviously occurring. So that's a check mark. If we look at photopolymerization, uh, we have to address that by using a distillate cut, which has a narrow carbon number distribution for the hydrocarbons. And so now we can track this as a function of photo radiation. So in the green box is, is the hydrocarbon material we start with from the uh, distillate cut. And after photo radiation, uh, we can clearly see that the water soluble oxidized transformation products are multiples of the original carbon number. So clearly photopolymerization is occurring. If we do the opposite for the photo decomposition, so now we don't look at a boiling cut, we look at the highest molecular weight or high carbon number species. We can look at an asphaltine film uh, that is photo irradiated. Uh, the carbon number of the starting material and DBE distributions are up here. And you can clearly see the water solubles uh, that are generated uh, are between carbon number 10 and 20, much lower than the original starting material. So clearly, uh, photo fragmentation has occurred. So if we put everything together, uh, we can address the three uh, uh, hypotheses from the Ixtoc, uh, all with check marks. Uh, we add one by the method and technique for interfacial material identification and photo radiated films. And so collectively, all four of these uh, hypotheses are supported and there are methods now that can be used to to analyze future spills. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, the people involved in this research, uh, Sydney Niles, Marta Chacon, Juan Chen, Phoebe Zito, David Pogorski, uh, Matt Tarr, Amy McKenna, and Chris Reddy and Bob Nelson. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative for funding and uh, to later answer any questions. Thanks.